Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 11th. Today's topic is news literacy with our special guest, Tiffany Whitehead. Your co-moderators are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula, who will now introduce Tiffany and ask her the newbie question. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us again today for Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, I am so excited to introduce Tiffany Whitehead, who is the school librarian at Episcopal School of Baton Rouge in Louisiana. She has been teaching for 10 years and became a National Board Certified Teacher of Library Media in 2013. Tiffany quickly rose to national prominence when she was named a mover and shaker by the Library Journal and an ISTE emerging leader in 2014. In 2016, she was named the School Librarian of the Year for Louisiana. She has several published articles in national journals and is the organizer of EdCamp Baton Rouge. Tiffany is known as librarian underscore tiff on Twitter. I remember meeting Tiffany for the first time at LeQ, which is our state conference, and then watching her meet her edu heroes at her first ISTE conference. She was one of the first people I reached out to for help in getting EdCamp Louisiana off the ground um, back in, I don't remember the year, but then we um, split up and we now have Ed Camp New Orleans and she has Ed Camp Baton Rouge. I have been thrilled and feel kind of like a proud mama as I have watched Tiffany rise from her early days of uh, social media to become the mover and shaker she is today. It's been thrilling for me to watch her career blossom. So. Let me introduce our dear, my dear friend and fellow Louisiana educator to you today and get ready to learn lots about media literacy with Tiffany Whitehead. Tiffany, the question is, your newbie question for today is, what is news literacy and why is it important to teach students to learn about it? All right, thank you so much, Paula, and I'm so excited to be with you guys today. Um, when we talk about news literacy, we're talking about how we teach our students to interpret the news and discern um, factual information from opinions, and the term fake news is used a lot these days. Um, and so it's really important that we have a lot of conversations with our students on how they are reading print media, how they're viewing television, how they're having information come to them online. Um, and this is definitely not a simple or easy thing to do. It's a very complex thing to teach. So I'm really excited to share some resources with you guys about this today. All right, um, so first of all, when we think about news literacy and when we think about especially fake news, um, you know, back before we were all online and had news coming to our cell phones immediately, it was a lot easier um, to discern real news, so to speak, from fake news. Um, the, you know, reputable newspapers, and the nightly news was the place to go. And that's where you depended on your news. And then you would see these, you know, um, like the Globe and National Enquirer at the, the checkout station um, at the grocery store. But it was kind of easy to say, well, that's, you know, the silly news or sensationalized news um, that people are putting out there. But now it's much more complex. Um, it's very difficult now for adults, not to mention for children, for students, to really learn how to vet and verify their news sources. Um, and so what I kind of want to start with today is working through some terms, because 
there, there's so much encompassed in this topic of media literacy and news literacy and fake news that I think it's important for us to think about the vocabulary and the terms that we use that we need to equip our students with. Um, and we know some of these words get thrown around in different ways. So I've, I've pulled some definitions. Um, a number of them come from the Stony Book University Center for News Literacy, which is an amazing resource. And also um, Melissa Zimdar's analysis of news sources. And I'm going to um, talk about both of those resources a little bit more later. But I want to start with media literacy. Literacy. And so the term media literacy, I like to think of as the big umbrella. And that's when we're talking about students' ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media. Um, it's the broader umbrella that takes into account things like marketing, propaganda, pop culture, all of those things. And news literacy kind of falls under that umbrella. News literacy really relates to teaching students and giving them the ability to use critical thinking skills, to judge reliability and credibility of news reports, whether it's coming from print, television, or the internet. And this is specifically relating to journalism. Now, we know that the term fake news is used quite frequently these days. Um, and when we're talking about fake news, as educators, we're referring to sources that are entirely fabricating information or disseminating deceptive content or they're grossly distorting actual news reports. Um, and so this kind of touches on a, a number of different issues that we're finding with journalism, with reporting, um, and the way that information is shared so quickly and broadly online. So that's the definition that we're going to use uh, when we're talking about fake news. Now, it's easy for fake news and satire sometimes to um, kind of be confused with each other. Satire is when someone is posting a news article and they're using humor, irony, exaggeration, ridicule, and false information to kind of comment on current events. And so, it's important that our students are able to understand satire, which is a very complex um, thing to try and understand, because oftentimes something that is published as satire ends up being perceived as news or fake news. Clickbait is a, a huge thing that students need to be able to recognize. And that's when sources that provide generally credible content, um, they're just using these outlandish headlines to get people to read the articles. They're exaggerated, they're misleading, questionable headlines, social media descriptions, or crazy images that they're posting um, to get you to click on the source. And this is something that we're seeing so much on social media. Um, people are always sharing these outlandish posts on Facebook um, with these crazy, crazy headlines that are designed to get you to click on them. Um, another term that we need to make sure our students know and are able to recognize is extreme bias. And these are sources that are coming from a particular point of view and rely on propaganda, um, opinions are distorted as facts, and so students really need to be able to read um, in a discerning way so that they can um, identify extreme bias. Now, something, uh, and these next few words really kind of um, all tie in together and are, are really um, a major issue in teaching uh, both students and adults to be aware um, of how news is delivered to them. So the first one is confirmation bias. And that's whenever we're pursuing information um, that reassures or reflects a person's particular point of view. A very similar term um, is the echo chamber. And that's an environment where a person encounters beliefs or opinions that coincide with their own. So their existing view is reinforced. 
and they're really not being exposed to any alternate ideas. And social media feeds make this easy um, to have a narrow amount of information that aligns with your own personal views. And, um, you know, when we think about, when we look at our own social media, um, I try and make sure that I have all sides, I have all opinions um, available to me. And I, I have a great mix of people um, that I'm friends with across all party lines because I want to make sure that the information um, and the news that I'm being exposed to is all over the board. Um, so the next term is rumor. And those are kind of the, the gossipy things. A lot of this rumor reporting um, is definitely clickbait. Many of the sources that are being shared are political, um, obviously, and they provide generally verifiable information, although they are in support, obviously, of a particular side. And when we talk about credible sources, um, that's new, news that circulates and information in a manner consistent with traditional and ethical practices in journalism. But what we have to keep in mind and what we have to really talk to our students about is the fact that even credible sources sometimes rely on clickbait style headlines. And sometimes they make mistakes. So no organization is perfect. And having our students understand that, um, that they have to really be cautious and discerning, even when it's coming from a source that they trust, um, can kind of be overwhelming. Uh, this is another phenomenon, and I have a video, there's a link to a video um, that's really great about circular reporting. And so um, that's what, what, when this happens, false confirmation, like a situation where a piece of information appears to come from multiple independent sources, but it's actually only coming from one source. So these sources are saying, oh, um, I, I found this out from this place, and they're kind of like citing each other back and forth. So it also happens when um, sources report on the same instance of false information that's being shared and make it appear valid and verified as it's reported from numerous sources. And this is a really great video um, that you can watch and share with your students on how false news spreads. So it explains the phenomenon of circular reporting and how these news stories get out there um, and circulate so quickly. So this is a really great short video. I definitely recommend that you save this and go back and watch it after the webinar. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about news gone viral. And so this, um, these next few charts that I'm going to show you come from some research that was done by BuzzFeed around the time of our last presidential election um, that last fall. And I think that this is really interesting, and this is a, a great thing to show and discuss with your students when you're talking about um, fake news. So Buzz, what BuzzFeed did um, for this, they analyzed um, from three different sources from mainstream, three different sources from the left leaning, and three sources that are right leaning. And they looked at all of the things that they posted for a certain period of time. And if you look at this, you can see how many of those sources are either mostly false or a mix of true and false. I mean, for some of them, you're looking at only half or less of the information that they're sharing was actually mostly true news. Um, and these are things that were being shared on Facebook. So I think it's really important that our students see something like this, the power of how the things that are being shared online may not be um, mostly true information. And I feel like this is another really powerful graph um, this shows the point in our election when 
the um, sharing of fake news from some of those sources actually surpassed the sharing of news from mainstream media. Um, and if, if this doesn't kind of give you chills and really just make you uncomfortable and nervous, um, I, I mean, that, it just blows my mind. But we, we're all on Facebook and we see this. And so um, teaching our students to be able to recognize and combat this is absolutely essential, um, especially when, you know, we know as educators the things, um, their parents are not equipped with these skills. They're not aware. In fact, they're often the ones sharing this information, these fake news stories as well. Um, so it's a very delicate thing. Um, and it's also very challenging sometimes for us as educators to be able to put aside our, our own personal feelings, our own political views. Um, but for this, we have to make sure that we are preparing our students on the side of awareness and, um, you know, verifying things, finding the truth. So this is a really interesting study by the Stanford History Education Group. Um, and there's a link where you can see the study in full. But I'm going to kind of explain what happened here. And this is also a, a, just a massively eye-opening thing for me. So what they did, um, the Stanford History Education Study Group, they looked at how students are evaluating information online. And they broke down students into groups, middle school, high school, and college. So for the middle school group, and this is the image that the students were looking at, they did a home page analysis where they did an evaluation of news websites. And so the students were tasked with discerning if the um, articles were either advertisements or if it was traditional news reporting. And when it comes to traditional news versus advertising, three-fourths of the students were able to correctly identify the sources. However, um, native advertising, and that's when a site tries to sell or promote a product with the guise of it being a news story. So they put in a little bit of fact, a little bit of information, but the main goal is to actually sell or promote something. And more than 80% of the students um, that participated in this survey believed that the native advertising, which is, was labeled here as sponsored content, was a real news story. Um, so it's so important that we work with our students on being able to discern what type of information. And it's getting harder. It's not getting easier to, to really be able to tell the difference. between news and advertising. So for the high school students, they had them evaluate evidence. And the students had to decide whether to trust a photograph that was posted on a photo sharing website. And in this um, evaluation, less than 20% of the students questioned the source of the post or the photo. And so you can see, you can look at this image, um, and it says, does this post provide strong evidence on the conditions near Hiroshima? power plant, um, and the, the photo says not much more to say. This is what happens when flowers get near, um, get nuclear burst effects. So the students, 40% of them argued that the photo was strong evidence. Um, and, and so that's really kind of scary that that many students said, oh, I trust this photo because someone posted it. And we know, we say this to the students all the time, and we say, you know, can you trust everything you see online? And they say, no, of course not. But then they see an image like this, and they say, oh, well, there's a picture of it, so it must be true. Um, having these conversations constantly with our students is so important. And this was a group of high school students. Um, and then the third evaluation they did was for claims on social media. And so they had a group of college students read a tweet and explain why it may or may not be a useful information source. And so this was a poll um, that was posted on a Twitter account. And very few of the students um, noted that it was based on a poll conducted by a professional polling firm, which is something that they should notice. 
Um, and then less than a third explained that the political agenda of the organization sharing the tweet should be considered. So these are just things that our students are not noticing. Um, they really need to be able to pick apart any source, any piece of news or information that's being shared. Um, and this is not an easy task. It's a very complex thing. Um, so here are some sources that I find helpful and use and reference um, and th that you may want to share with your students, um, depending on the level. But this is definitely useful information for you as an adult um, to also share with your friends. Because a as educators, we do have a duty to make sure that we're working um, not only to share with our students, but also with our peers. And so this is an incredible uh, resource that Melissa Zenders created. It's a Google Doc full of information on false, misleading, clickbaity, and satirical news sources. So within this doc, um, she has some tips for analyzing news sources. She has steps for analyzing websites. Some of the terms that I've thrown out there and talked about a little bit earlier, they, those definitions came from her. Um, but she on this doc has a working website list of over a thousand websites and she breaks them down by um, the, some of the different terms like clickbait or unreliable, fake, satirical. Um, so this is a really great thing to be able to show your students how many sources there are out there um, that people are posting and sharing and using that are definitely questionable in their content. These are some other um, resources that I recommend checking out and using regularly um, to verify information. So the first one is factcheck.org. And this is um, a project from the Attenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania. So they're nonpartisan, nonprofit, and they're consumer advocates who are mostly um, posting on uh, factual accuracy of what is said by major U.S. political players in the form of TV ads, debates, speeches, interviews, and news releases. Um, so this is a great source of um, being able to check on political information. Another one is PolitiFact, and they're a fact-checking website that rates the accuracy of claims by elected officials. And this one I think is kind of fun. Um, so they have a truth -a meter which they gauge the accuracy of statements. They have a flip -a meter which they rate whether an elected official has been consistent uh, on an issue. And then they have a promise meter. So that's where they gauge uh, progress made on campaign promises. Um, this is the the people who um, run this are editors and reporters from the Tampa Bay Times. So this is another source that I use regularly. Um, I really like All Sides. Um, this is a website where um, they're, they're pulling from news sources, but they're, they're rating whether it's in the center, whether it's left, whether it's right, and they kind of gauge um, how far it leans. But this is really nice because for each topic or news story, they have articles relating to it across the board. So they have something down the middle, something down the left, something leaning right. Um, and this is a great one to share with your students to get them to see what bias looks like um, in the news. Snopes is one that's been around since 1994. Um, and this is not as much um, for checking political things, although they do post that. This is where I go if there's some kind of hoax or urban legend or email scam, clickbait, um, and they do a great job of organizing things like, you know, when somebody posts something that sounds totally outlandish, you go and check on Snopes and then you post on their Facebook. Um, that maybe they should go and read this article instead. All right, so next I want to share several um, really great graphics 
that I think are share worthy for you and your students. And museum has some fabulous uh, resources, and this is one of their infographics. Is this story share worthy? Um, in fact, I shared this on my my Facebook page as soon as I saw it because as I scroll through, I always see things that are definitely not share worthy. And um, we really have to talk to our students about how important it is to stop and think before we post something. It's really frightening how easy it is to just reshare or retweet or repost something. Often people are doing that without reading an article in its entirety um, or taking the time to stop and think about the news source. And so this is a really simple, easy infographic um, that walks you through thinking before you share or post something. This is another one um, by a museum. It's called Escape Junk News. And I, I really like that um, it kind of breaks down the process of thinking through determining if something is factual or fake. This is another great resource, and it comes from the Breaking News Consumer Handbook, um, the Fake News Edition. And this is a, a great kind of step-by-step -step on walking through how you can determine if something is fake news. Um, so these are great resources that you could just take and print out and post around your school, your classroom, your library, wherever you may be. Um, put them next to the computers. Sharing things and sending these home with students um, so that their parents can see them and can work in on that discussion as well, I think is really important. All right, um, so the craft test is something that I've used for a couple of years. Um, I work with middle school a lot, so giving them the opportunity to say crap, they <laughs> really enjoy. Um, but having a, a standard um, protocol for evaluating a trustworthy source is really important for your students. Um, having something that you stick to and you constantly get them in the habit of walking through the process of evaluating a source. And so for the crap test, this is your list of questions that you would work through. Um, when was the information published? Is it current? Does this information relate to my big question um, and give me what I'm looking for? Is it relevant? Who wrote this and how do I know that they're qualified, their authority? Um, can I verify that the information is true? Is it accurate? And what is the purpose of the article, fact or opinion? So although this looks like a pretty simple list, um, I was working through this um, just a couple of weeks ago with some sixth graders. And it's really challenging um, to get our students to understand how they can even figure these things out. Um, you know, as I've been preparing for this to share with you guys, I, I definitely feel like I don't have all of the answers, and teaching news literacy is kind of overwhelming um, because, one, it's so important to prepare our students to um, equip them with the skills to be able to go and find the information they need and verify it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I definitely feel the challenge um, with you guys, but I also know how important this is. And so it's definitely something that we have to continue to work through. All right, so next I am going to share some really great um, sources for you as an educator that you can take and actually use with your students. So these are kind of um, different uh, either lessons or websites um, or activities or even at the end I have a couple of different pretty much full curriculums um, that you can use with your students to work through news literacy. So the first one, um, TED has absolutely amazing resources on 
such a wide range of topics, but they have a number of really, really um, great videos to spark discussion on news literacy. Um, so this one that I have pictured here is how to choose your news. And it's a really great video that discusses the history of news um, and how trust was really broken with traditional news sources. So they go way back to, you know, when the only way we really got our information was from the morning paper and from the evening news and how we've progressed to a place um, where really anyone can be considered a journalist or a reporter. All they need is a blog, have their platform, um, gain an audience, and they're really able to share. And so it, it really focuses on how the Internet has changed the way that news is shared. And this can lead to some really great discussions with students on how the media landscape has changed over time and what they can do um, to make sure they are being discerning as they are interpreting their news. This is a great lesson um, from Teaching Tolerance. Um, and so this is another really great video um, that talks about how fake news spreads. Um, also, this link here has a, another really, really great list of terminology. And the reason that I spent so much time going through terminology um, at the be beginning of this webinar is because I, I feel like that's such a great place for us to start with our students. They really have to understand what we're talking about and, and, and what these different terms mean. What does it really mean when somebody's saying fake news? What, what, what is satire? What is bias? They have to understand these concepts before they're able to identify them. So this teaching tolerance link has some great um, definitions that you can work through with your students. But this video in particular um, discusses the phenomenon of how fake news spreads. And you guys may remember um, back at the time of the election, there was um, an example of uh, fake news spreading like wildfire. This guy who like had very few followers on Twitter snapped a picture of a bus um, and said that, they were protesters that were being brought in, and Donald Trump retweeted that, and then it just totally exploded and blew up. And this video walks through the timeline of how that happened, of how fake news actually ends up sometimes in mainstream media. I mean, even this past week we had an instance where um, I'm sure many of you saw on your Facebook feed um, the president feeding the koi fish and, and that, even little things like that that blow up into these huge issues now. Um, it's really important that our students are able to recognize what is valid news, um, how they can go and um, kind of verify and confirm those things. And we really need to equip them to be the people who can go out and say, hey, you really need to go back and check your source. You might want to think about that before you post it. This um, source deck activity is really great um, for research, but I, I think that it would really lend itself well to new, a news literacy conversation. So the way that this source deck activity works um, you, you take a screenshot of a variety of information sources and you include a citation for each. And then based on the snapshot and source information, the students have to evaluate the source and its relevance. Um, so I think, and I haven't been able to do this yet, but I, I hope to very soon, I, I think that pulling um, a number of sources on one news topic and having students work in groups to go through and evaluate each source, um, not, not even by reading the entire thing, just by looking at the pieces of information that's available 
and practicing um, kind of the art of being discerning when looking at news, I, I think that this type of activity would lend itself to some really great conversations with your students. And that's what news literacy and, and building those skills and teaching this is all about. Um, it's not something straightforward that's a simple answer that you're going to just, you know, be able to teach one lesson to your students and they're going to go and be news literacy experts. That is not how this works. It's a constant conversation and a constant pushing and pulling that we as educators um, need to continue to engage in. Okay, uh, Common Sense Media is one of my favorite curriculum resources um, when it comes to any type of digital citizenship. Um, and they have some great resources compiled um, and lessons to help turn students into fact-finding detectives. And I really like the way that they've curated these resources here. Um, and so I, I definitely recommend checking out this link going, clicking through. It's not just the lessons they have from Common Sense Media here, um, but they, they also have pulled from another, uh, from a number of other resources as well. Newseum, uh, their website also has some really great resources for educators on media literacy. They have lesson plans, they have artifacts, they have case studies. Um, they also offer some virtual classes and professional development for educators. Um, and, and it's really great because Museum is really able to um, capture the, the history and the change that has happened in the media landscape. And so I, I love the resources that they have available here, not just those infographics that I shared, but some really um, some lessons that will really take you into some deep conversations with your students. All right, and the last source that I have to, um, that I want to share with you guys is called Checkology. And um, this is one that I just discovered as I was preparing um, to share all of this with you guys. And this is something that I'm excited to, um, to use with some of my teachers and my students. So it's a resource from the News Literacy Project. And it provides a virtual classroom. They have um, 12 interactive lessons to help your students learn to evaluate and interpret news. So it actually walks them through. Um, it's interactive. They have lots of videos. Um, it's a great way to get your students thinking about different types of news, how we interpret news. Um, they have topics from detecting and dissecting viral news rumors. They have investigating the impact of the personalization algorithm, um, thinking about the filter bubble, which is not even something that I got into with this. There's so many things that we can talk about. Um, they have activities on evaluating bias and interpreting the First Amendment. And I did want to share that um, they're currently offering a premium access for free for a limited time. So make sure if that, this sounds like something that you're interested in, that you go ahead and sign up for um, a free account with Checkology very soon. All right, so kind of wrapping it up, um, I had to throw in a couple of memes. And, and this is what we're facing. Fake news um, is everywhere. You don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture to quote with a quote next to it. Um, but always check your sources. I, I love memes. They're so much fun. Um, but that, I feel like this encompasses um, how big this idea of news literacy is. Um, it's, it's such an important topic. It's something that is continuing to develop and change. Um, but it's such an essential thing for us to incorporate into our teaching and learning in any way that we can. Just having that conversation and continuing it is so important. All right, this is my contact information. I just wanted to put it out there and share. But I yes, am excited Tiffany, to see I did if you guys have questions. any questions or things that we need to further discuss. And if anybody has any others, please type them in the chat. Which sources would you recommend for 
beginning these lessons with three to five grade students. And that was from Paula. I would definitely um, recommend starting with Common Sense Media. They mm -hmm. have um, some, some great resources. You, you have to start, it's so overwhelming, I know. Uh, you have to start really basic, though. And mm -hmm. at that point, at that age, bias is really um, a thing that you have to make sure you're teaching them, you know. It used to be so simple when we would teach fact and opinion, and now mm -hmm. um, teaching students that most of the source, news sources that we encounter are going to have bias, and that doesn't necessarily make them bad, um, but we have to be able to recognize it and make sure that there's a balance. Um, and I think Common Sense Media has some, some great resources on that. Okay. Um, I'm curious at what age news literacy and fake news should be taught to students. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to have conversations about news from an early age because they're seeing it. And if it's, mm -hmm. you know, something relevant in the news, definitely, um, you know, as you see appropriate with the group of students you have and the age that you're working with. But directly teaching news literacy and starting to kind of dig into sources and what that means, I think fourth and fifth grade is definitely a place um, where, where they're working on research, they're looking at information on a regular basis, and they need to start building those skills. And that may be what, what Peggy's getting at. Maybe you have to start with the younger students, just helping them understand the difference between truth and lies. Definitely. Not, and there, not even um, considering media. Oh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but there's this really cool book. It might be it's something like Two Truths and a Lie. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a book, um, and each chapter has three kind of topics that it goes through, and two of them are true, and one of them is fabricated. And so mm -hmm. that would be a fun way with the younger ones um, to kind of work through how do you know? How do you figure it out? Um, mm -hmm. So not necessarily, you know, we're not looking at big news headlines, but being able to discern um, between what is true and what is false and how do you know. Mm -hmm. Do you have resources on how to teach teachers to then be able to teach their students properly to spot fake news and fake content? Yes. So I think that um, as I was preparing this webinar to do with you guys, I said, oh my god, this is what I need to teach my teachers. We need to have some professional development on this. Mm -hmm. And just like I said before, I, I think that vocabulary and getting familiar with the terminology is really important when we're talking about news literacy. Um, the museum has some really great professional development um, resources available, so that's definitely where I would point to start when um, thinking about what can we do to help our colleagues um, be better equipped to teach this. Okay. Since some students are, are just learning how to find reliable facts while doing research, how would you recommend those students get started? Um, so I, I definitely think using a tool like the crap test or, you know, some other mnemonic device mm -hmm. um, where it's, it's a, they need to develop a habit. And so if there's a way that you can have some 
regimented way in which when they look at a source, they kind of go through a checklist before they decide um, if, if that's a source that they want to use or not. And this is, this is something that I did um, just a couple of weeks ago with a sixth grade group. There's a lot of modeling involved with this. Um, yeah. it's, it's overwhelming for them. And so you have to spend a lot of time um, walking through the steps with them and discussing it because there, this is one of those things where there's not necessarily a easy right or wrong answer, but it's a skill that they have to continue to develop. So walking through it with them as much as possible, going through the process of evaluating, and then when they're doing it on their own, um, making them explain how and why. And when we're talking about things like this, it's very similar to how I talk to my teachers when we're planning about if they're doing research. Um, lots of times when you're working with students, you need them to get the content. And so if the goal is for them to get the content, then a lot of times you pick the sources that they're going to use um, to find the information that they need. But we can't forget about the process. And there are a lot of times where um, we need to spend the bulk of our time working them through the process of evaluating sources. What questions do we ask? How do we decide if this is a good resource for this topic? How do we decide if this is a source that we can trust? OK. Those are the questions I was able to capture from the chat. Does anyone else have any questions for Tiffany? And if so, please type them. Again, thank you so much, Tiffany. You shared some information for all of us to really um, be able to digest and use, not only with students, but with our own news gathering. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was just so helpful. And we can have a lot of links and resources, but to have somebody talk us through them and let us know not only how you've used them, but why they're important and what is great to do with our students, that was just great. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And we do have a, a great show coming up next Saturday um, that's going to relate to Future Ready Schools. And there was a lot of focus on Future Ready Librarians in the Librarians Conference this last week. Abby Fattrell and Nancy Magno are going to join us and be sharing on that topic. We are going to take a week off for Thanksgiving weekend in the United States, even though I know that it's not a date that everyone celebrates Thanksgiving. But we'll be taking that break, and then we'll be back and we'll have regular webinars every Saturday through December 16th until we take our winter break. So December 2nd, we have the amazing Stephen Anderson joining us. And he's going to be talking about a topic that's so important for us, about how we can create accessible digital content for everyone so that all students have equal access to the learning. And then the amazing Shannon Miller is going to be with us on December 9th doing a tall webinar featuring Buncee. And she is just the master guru at using Buncee. So we're really looking forward to that. So we hope you'll join us every Saturday you can. And I know that many of you find Saturday a very busy time. So everything is recorded, and you'll be able to access it all later. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where as long as you're 
Blackboard Collaborate session is open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or from within the Live Binder. You can also nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection for the, all the sessions are on iTunes U. And as you exit this session, the survey link should open up. Here's the direct link. You can take that link from the chat. It's also in the live binder. And at the bottom of the survey, you can also request a professional development certificate. And thanks to Patty Ruffing for sending these out. They also print with your name. Please, though, if you request one, make sure it's a personal email address and not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Our special thanks again to our special guest, Tiffany Whitehead, to Steve Harbidon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for, for coming. <laughs>